Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Journalists and real estate brokers are preoccupied with the term mid-century modern. Now, ultimately, this is helpful because now that there's a buzzword, it's much more likely that such homes will be preserved. But prior to that, they were knocking down mid-century modern residences in order to make room for McMansions. I recently had an opportunity to visit two mid-century modernist masterpieces, and the contrast between these two residences is an illustration in the difference between architectural theory and architectural publicity. Philip Johnson's Glass House is a testament to his ability to guide the architecture conversation of the 20th century. For this house, Philip Johnson was both client and architect, and subsequently was never forced to sacrifice design purity to make the house livable. It is famous for all the exterior walls being glass. Your first reaction is such a house is uninhabitable, and you might be right, unless, of course, you were Philip Johnson. First, this is his country home, a second home when he got out of the city. Secondly, the glass house is possible because it gets its privacy through the distance from its neighbors and the surrounding 47-acre landscape. This house is suitable for one person living, perhaps with a companion. The sleeping, cooking, dining, and living spaces are totally exposed with this open and simple plan. Fortunately, Johnson did give in to some conventions and isolated the bathroom behind a brick wall. Otherwise, you'd see Philip Johnson... <laughs> but it is only livable because he had other buildings on the site to which he could retreat and which provided the ancillary functions you might normally find in a single building called a house. Galleries and libraries were separate buildings. There was also the original 18th century farmhouse on the property that got used. Guests were housed in the separate and very solid brick house, where Johnson frequently slept as well, because even Philip Johnson could not live in the fishbowl for a long time. Face it, the glass house was Philip Johnson's version of glamping, and it would not surprise me if he designed it more for the publicity than as a place to live. Because of his financial independence, Johnson was able to indulge his design theories. And Johnson was very close to Bauhaus architect Mies van der Rohe. Mies designed the Farnsworth House and displayed a model of the design in a 1947 show at the Museum of Modern Art, where Philip Johnson happened to be the architecture curator. And there are famous stories about the delays and arguments between Mies and Mrs. Farnsworth, and the house was not completed until 1951, four years later. Many suspect that Johnson, seeing Mies's work in progress, liked the idea so much that he decided to use it as both client and architect, purified it, and was able to build it by 1949, thus stealing Mies's thunder. And you know Johnson promoted the hell out of his design achievement. It was apparent that Ludwig Mies van der Rohe did not appreciate Philip Johnson's glass house. Johnson noted, Mies thought the workmanship was bad, that the design was bad, that it was a bad copy of his Farnsworth house, which had inspired me. He thought I should have understood his work better. Johnson responded by criticizing some of Mies's favorite buildings. Really? Philip Johnson criticizing other buildings? Maybe people who live in glass houses should not throw stones? Oh, come on. You knew I was going to use that at some point during this video. Regardless, history will always point to the glass house as a seminal moment in 20th century modern architecture. And when Philip Johnson died in the house in 2005, the property and house were donated to the National Trust and open to the public a short time later. On the other hand, 1957's Miller House by Aero Saarinen was designed for a large traditional family 
and is no less modern and no less important, even if it is less famous. Aero Steranen also designed the St. Louis Gateway Arch, Architecture Codex, video number 27. Aero Saarinen did few residential projects, but his close association with J. Irwin Miller, CEO of Cummings, and Columbus, Indiana's biggest patron of art and architecture, allowed Saarinen a chance to explore a different kind of building. Miller, his wife Xenia, and Saarinen would proudly talk about how the house was a collaborative effort, with Saarinen respecting the Miller's needs and the Miller's respecting Saarinen's design idiom. The whole process seems almost idealistically tranquil, and it supports my theory that great architects need great clients in order to produce great work. Philip Johnson also had a great client for the glass house, himself. Even years after Saarinen's death in 1961, the family would consult with architect Kevin Roach of Roach and Dinkaloo, Architecture Codex video number seven, who worked on the original project to make sure any adaptations were consistent with the design concept. Consequently, 50 years later, the house's original design integrity is maintained. Changes are inevitable with a building, and architects understand that, and will usually adapt their designs. But too often the changes are made by a talentless hack, who doesn't understand the original building, and instead imposes their limited concept of taste onto the edifice. I'm sorry, did I just expose myself as an architectural snob? The plan shows an open central living space exposed on numerous facades, with the very influential conversation pit. It also has four box and quadrants at the corners that create privacy. One for the guests and carport, one for the kitchen and support spaces, one for the children, and one for the Millers themselves. The Miller house was the primary house for this family of seven, and while it was in a residential neighborhood, the size of the lot and perimeter trees and fences gave it a bit more privacy, as devised by the landscape architect Dan Kiley. And working closely with interior designer Alexander Gerard, the house is both personal and refined. It does not have the coldness we might normally associate with modern architecture. Neighbors talked about how friendly the Millers were and how many of the neighborhood kids would come over and play with the Miller children in the big yard or at the family pool. And there were many dinner parties here at the Miller house like they had at the Glass house. Except at the Miller house, the primary topic of discussion was usually how to make the world better through Christian unity and civil rights. Whereas at the Glass house, apparently the primary topic of conversation was how great Philip Johnson was. Saarinen's structure was created by a series of steel columns that branched off at the top to support the roof and many skylights. The house follows the modern concept of design being reduced to point, line, and plane, but it is much more complex than the glass house, and subsequently its modernity is more subtle, gentle, and familial. Surfaces run from edge to edge and are distinguished by materials, and where the joints and transitions occur, they are perfectly aligned. Colors pop because the adjacent surfaces might be muted. Large glass areas slide open to the air, increasing the design transparency. None of it was imposed by Saarinen on the family. It evolved together, and so the house was very livable. Since it was a private residence for a private family, albeit community-minded, it was never publicized the way the glass house was. Once, the design and pictures were featured in a national magazine and attributed to Aero Saarinen. But the family name and location were never revealed. Only recently did the family leave the house and donated it to the Indianapolis Museum of Art, who opened it to the public in 2009. As iconic as these two homes were, they did not tell the complete story. The mid-century modern residence was a post-World War II dream by those who lived through the Depression and fought in the war, as a chance for them to leave their urban dwelling and go live the good life among trees and lawn. These homes were affordable, small because it was presumed the family would be the caretakers, they were not designed to have staff, 
like the mansions built in the country the previous 100 years, or today's behemoth houses that require waves of illegal immigrants to maintain them so the nouveau riche can live like Louis XIV. Sure, the traditional roles presumed the wife and mother would be cooking the meals herself, and the husband and dad would be mowing the lawn and repairing things to make their life better. The children would share bedrooms and maybe even the bathroom with the parents, and the house could have a carport instead of a garage for the single family car. Most living was on one level, and most dominant designs included a flat roof, large amounts of glass, and no traditional gingerbread detailing and molding inside and out. My mentor, Don Ryman, and his partners, Walter Sanders and Art Malson, built many of these homes in the lower Hudson Valley. In many ways, their work made human the cold principles of modernism, and their work, plus the work of many others, deserve the kind of respect and preservation given to famous architects. Today I see such homes are often obliterated by the new owners, but occasionally I see one restored, often to a luxurious glory much beyond the original house. It is comforting there are those who appreciate the revolutionary ideas about home and living in the mid-20th century. Urbanists decry the freedom associated with suburban development, but I have noticed that those rich elitist urbanists often have two expensive homes, one in the city and at least one other in the country, mountains, or on the shore. They live the good life, but seem not to want others who can only afford one home to encroach on resources they'd rather have dedicated to themselves. There are more poor socialist urbanists who decry the suburbs because they cannot stand anyone enjoying life and having fun, as they are determined to be miserable until everyone listens to them. Their housing solutions can be seen in these soulless concrete blocks built across the communist world, and nobody likes living in those buildings. So while Philip Johnson's glass house remains a paean to modernist architectural theory, Aero Saarinen's Miller House may be more indicative of a true mid-century modern residence, with its traditional family structure, even though the structure was not traditional. And it might be a lesson in how humble, ordinary people who do not live for publicity, but rather make their contributions anonymously, may actually be the movers and shakers in this world. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex. Thank you.